we move into the Sun Belt East predictions and previews. And we got a lot to discuss. Uh, this is a just incredibly difficult division. I, I don't think you're going to see anybody dominate this division this season. We'll go ahead and start off with the App State Mountaineers, Appalachian State. And, whew, this bunch, they, are, they were really good last year. Really, really good. But they were led by their defense a lot last season. Uh, they lose wide receiver Corey Sutton. They lose offensive lineman Bear Hunter, uh, which was just an awesome name. Just an awesome name. Defensive end Demetrius Taylor was awesome. DeMarco Jackson was awesome. Quarterback Sean Jolly was awesome. Those guys are all gone. When you look at what's going on with their postgame win expectancy, they, they went 10-4 and four last year. They lost the bowl game, right? They went 10-3 and three in the regular season. They really probably should have been 11-2. And, two. and uh, projected SP Plus this year is 8-4. and four. And that's about where I've got them. We'll get to that here in just a minute. They were number 9 in PPA margin last year. That is really good. They were number 30 in offensive PPA per drive. That is predicted points added per drive. And number 16 on defense. That is a really really good margin. That is a sign of an elite team. However, when you look at the numbers here, turnover margin, number 90, and penalties per game was number 66. The penalties per game, totally understandable. When you have an aggressive defense, you're going to get stuff like that. Uh, When you have an aggressive offense, as they did last year, which is one of the reasons why they were so good, is the offense actually became somewhat explosive. But when you, the penalties per game is fine. It's the turnover margin. And we've talked about this with Chase Bryce before. You remember when he was at Duke the season before last? Through turnovers, through interceptions, like crazy. And it's not that he was awful last year. It's just it was too much to be able to deal with what was going on, which is why they were projected to have won at least one more game in the regular season than they did. So it's kind of a mess there. Looking at the offense, Chase Bryce is back. Uh, But his top three wide receivers are gone. Only one wide receiver returns that caught more than five passes. They got four seniors on the offensive line, so that's good. But you got to hope that that run game can improve because they were number 76 in rushing success rate last year. You got to improve that. App State has always been better at running the football than they were last year. It was just, it was kind of a mess. Uh, With that said, the running backs, People and Noel, uh, they return. Uh, The passing game was the key last year. They need the wide receiver, Christian Wells, and, of course, incoming transfers to be able to step up here. It's, it's just a little, eh. I don't know, I don't know exactly what to say. Um, I think the offense will be okay. Having the signal caller back definitely helps, regardless of the turnover situation and all that. But, and, of course, having four starting offensive linemen helps. But you weren't very good at running the football last year, and now you got a whole new crop of skill players. That's going to be interesting. That's going to be interesting. On the defense, you got nine players back with 300 plus snaps. Uh, linebackers Hampton and Harrington combined for 27 tackles for loss last year. Cornerback Stephen Jones had five interceptions. You do have key pieces. The problem is you've only got 58% returning production. That is number 86 in the country. It does help that you've got those nine guys that are experienced, but again, you've got pieces here. Can the whole defense gel and continue to run what Sean Clark wants them to do on defense? That's what I'm curious about. Uh, the key is to the season that I've got here. Stop turning the football over. I already talked about that. It, again, they should have been 11-2 and two last year, and they ended up 10-3. and three. They need the wide receivers to develop quickly if they want to maintain what they were doing last year. The, the explosive offense took them to a whole new level. Like That's what I'm curious about. I, I want to know what this team looks like this season when you don't have Sutton, when you don't have uh, all of those other playmakers. What, what is this offense going to look like? Are they going to be able to improve that running game? Because that is what they have leaned on in the past. So, I would expect eh, about 8-4 and four for this team. I like App State. I think they're going to be pretty good. 8-4 and four looks reasonable to me. Uh, you know, going bowling again, maybe can win this conference or maybe win this division. I mean, maybe the conference. I don't know. This is a really difficult conference. But regardless, App State looks to be still in pretty good shape. Uh, Just a few holes here and there, but I think you could say that for everybody in the Sun Belt East, or maybe just the Sun Belt in general. All right. The Georgia State Panthers. Now, 
This is Sean Ellis's bunch. Going to pull them up on the screen here. Went eight and five last year. Uh, during the regular season, their post game win expectancy looked to be seven point eight and four point two. That is pretty good. Pretty good considering how they started out. They opened one and four. They finished seven and one. Uh, their non conference was ridiculous. It looks pretty ridiculous again this year, uh, especially with opening at South Carolina, and then you got North Carolina coming in. North Carolina, by the way, why would you do this to yourself? North Carolina scheduled uh, App State and Georgia State back to back to open the season. I mean, just just absurd, especially when you were losing Sam Howell as your quarterback. But regardless, we'll see. We'll see. Let's let's talk about the offense here. Uh, by the way, returning production here for Georgia State, number four in the country, bringing back eighty five percent of their offense. Uh, not offense, excuse me, of their team. Number 11 on offense, number four on defense. They're bringing back 84% of the offense, 87% of the defense. This is a team, like I said, that finished 7-1 and one to close out last year. Sean Ellis has done a pretty awesome job with, you know, this little old program right outside of Atlanta, or right in Atlanta, we'll say that. Uh, let's talk about the offense. Trent McKnight is the new offensive coordinator. He was the wide receivers coach. Uh, Brad Glenn, the offensive coordinator, left for Virginia Tech. They brought in another guy. He left for a job at Louisville. You know, whatever. Trent McKnight at least knows what is going on with this offense. I would look for them to continue on the same trajectory that they were last year. They bring back Darren Granger, the quarterback. Now, he, they've got four starting offensive linemen back as well. they got the running back, Tucker Gregg, back. Two starting wide receivers uh, for an offense that averaged over six yards per play in their last eight games of the regular season. That is pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, as efficient as the offense was, they were not great when it came to explosive plays. Their success rate was really, really good. Uh, Rushing success rate number 20, passing success rate number 40, but number 109 in explosive play rate on offense. And, excuse me, number 123 uh, in explosive play rate on offense. They're number 72 in 10-plus yards, uh, 10-plus yard plays, and number 85 in 30-plus yard plays. They've got to be more explosive this year, especially if they want to come out of the gate hot. Because three of your first four are at South Carolina, North Carolina, and then against Coastal Carolina. And then, oh, by the way, they do host Charlotte in there, and we know that Will Healy's bunch can be a pain in the rear end. So that along with you got a trip to Army right after that. I mean, your first five games are pretty damn difficult. Looking at the defense, uh, Nate Fukua is the new defense, or is the defense coordinator, has been there for a long time. This is the same as the offense here. The, the defense, <laughs> I said the numbers backwards earlier. Uh, on offense, rushing success rate was number 23. Passing success rate was number 20. On defense, rushing success rate is number 20. Passing success rate allowed is number 40. Uh, you're number 109 in explosive play rate allowed. That ain't good. Number 79 in 10-plus yard plays. Number 73 in 20-plus yard plays. You've got to stop the big plays on defense. It's going to kill you every time. Everything else looked perfectly fine. Turnover margin, number 29. Uh, the, the penalties per game, number 39. Like, this was a good team, and they moved fast, too. They, they averaged the number 23 total plays per game in the country. This is a good football team. It just took them a little while to get rolling. Do they take as long this year to get rolling? Do you come out of the gate one and four again? That wouldn't. Nobody wants that. Uh, the rest of the schedule is pretty manageable. I mean, you got a lot of road games, but regardless, it is what it is. You, you've got some good teams here. Well, I guess my question is, can McKnight continue the offensive efficiency and find a way to be more explosive? Uh, if so, like this team is certainly a championship contender in the Sun Belt. I think this team could be really, really good. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've only got them with one conference loss. Like I think they're really good. I, I've got them at eight and four. But that's because I've got a loss to Army. I've got a loss to North Carolina. I've got a loss to South Carolina. They could win any of those games. This team could be 10-2. and two. They could be 11-1. and one. I don't see them going undefeated because, I mean, this is a hell of a schedule. Uh, they, they bring back 16 starters. This was a really good team last year. I've got a lot of faith in them to be good again. But, again, that non-conference schedule, just brutal. Just brutal. So, 8-4 and four for them as well. Uh, if you go by the records and whatnot, I mean, I've got them winning the division. I've got them winning the division. I've got them sitting there at uh, seven and one in the conference. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right, we're going to move on 
to the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers. Of course, this is one of Chris's favorites. We all love Jamie Chadwell. He came on the show with us last season. They uh, Or no, I guess two years ago when all the COVID stuff was going on. But fantastic, fantastic coach. Sexy style of offense. It, he, he does the option, but a lot more passing. Very accurate passing. And he does it fairly regularly. They still run the ball, you know, more than a 60 to 40 clip. But really fun team. This team, however... I know they're bringing back quarterback Grayson McCall, and that's certainly good. You want your signal caller back, but they're number twenty or number one twenty-two in returning production, forty-eight percent. It's number ninety-two on offense, number one twenty-five on defense. That defense, while they weren't great last year, uh, they were number fifty-one in PPA per drive allowed. They were still good enough that they went ten and two, and then of course went to the bowl game. You. You can't afford a drop-off in that spot. I know that the offense is good. Uh, PPA per drive was number two in the country last year. Their PPA margin was number three. That's how good the offense was. But on offense, again, you are missing a ton of guys. I mean, this team lost 15 starters from last year's team. Uh, Everything does revolve around the quarterback, Grayson McCall, talking about the offense now. But who are the playmakers? The running back, Jones. The wide receiver, Hilai. I hope I say that right. Healy. Um, And then the tight end, Isaiah Likely, three offensive line starters are gone as well. Like, those guys are all gone. Who is going to step up to be the playmakers here? Obviously, when you have a Grayson McCall, you can make playmakers. Your quarterback can make guys good. We saw that with Tom Brady all those years that he was at New England. Uh, Chadwell's offense is still going to be a lot of fun. Option principles, deadly accurate passing. It's almost impossible to stop. But again, was this just a ton of talent that all seemed to develop at the same time? And then they finally found the right signal callers? Or, eh, I I mean, can they develop? That's what I'm curious about. On defense, uh, they've made major upgrades the last couple of seasons. But what do they look like with only 41% returning production? That's what I'm curious about. Potential star power, defensive end Josiah Stewart, cornerback Strong and Boykin, only 102 snaps returning at linebacker. And one of those guys had 90 of them. That's not good. You don't have really any experience. Uh, Can the defense gel early? is the question here. I'm not certain yet. <laughs> I, just, I just don't know. Uh, the keys to this season here, I've got develop the offensive line and establish new playmakers, which should theoretically be easier because, of course, again, quarterback uh, McCall is back. Defense has pieces, uh, but number 125 on returning production is not good. Seven total transfers came in, five on defense. They only brought in one linebacker transfer, and, I mean, it wasn't exactly a big name. So uh, the question I've got, of course, for this season, is Jamie Chadwell a lifer here because of the type of offense that he runs, which is, to me, the sexy option. Is anybody going to be willing to hire him because of all the negative stigma that has revolved around somebody running the option? He is showing you that you can do it and pass the ball and still be a really fun football team. But I think he's also shown that you have to have the right quarterback. you got to have the right guy. But I think you're, you're seeing that across the country. If you're going to win in college football, you got to have the right quarterback. They are worth so much to programs now. And Grayson McCall is the fact that he came back and didn't transfer. Uh, I believe he could have gone to the NFL this year. He put out that statement about him pissing teal and whatnot. I, this is just a fun team to root for. I've got him at eight and four again. I, my, some of this might be bias. Now I don't think that they are going to be very good in conference. I've got them losing three games in conference. Uh, I've also got them losing at Virginia in the non-con. So I don't think they're going to be great in conference, but. Still, 8-4 and four is 8-4, and four. and if you can do that three straight years at Coastal Carolina, why could you not do that somewhere else? That's my question. I'm, I'm interested what this team looks like because the returning production is not great. Do you have enough depth? Do you, was this just uh, the stars all aligned for Coastal Carolina or, you know, over the last two years, or is this something that can continue? Is it something that can be built? It's not just a flash in the pan. It's not just a, a strike of lightning. Moving on from there, the Georgia Southern Eagles and Clay Helton's bunch. 
That's uh, it is officially Clay Helton's bunch. We're not talking Trojans here. We are talking the Eagles. Went three and nine last year. Now Clay Helton, of course, was not here last year. He was in between jobs. He got fired early at USC. Took this job early and has kind of started things. And he started the ball rolling pretty quickly by picking up that four star running back uh, recruit. Like that's definitely definitely good. And that's Terrence Gibbs, by the way. Uh, looking at these numbers, they're number 35 in returning production. I don't know what that means, though, because this is a triple option team that is switching over to more of a pro style. Georgia Southern went 3-9 and nine last year. Their post-game win expectancy said that they probably should have been 4-8. and eight. But again, they fired Chad Lunsford early last season. What do, what do these numbers even mean? You were number 116 in PPA margin number 109 in net points per drive, number 116 in offensive predicted points added per drive. You were number 101 in defensive predicted points added per drive. None of this makes any sense. Number 116 in turnover margin, number 49 in penalties per game. I, but I don't know what any of that means heading into this season. Looking at the offense, the new offensive coordinator, Brian Ellis, was the co-OC at Western Kentucky last year. He and uh, uh, Zach... I forget the guy's name off my off my head. Zach Kitley, I believe it is, who went to Texas Tech. They were the guys that were running Western uh, Kentucky's offense last year. And, of course, they were throwing the ball all over the place with Bailey Zapp. Are they going to be able to do the same thing here? You know, I think that when you swap from the triple, obviously transfers can speed up that process. They bring in quarterback Kyle Ventries from Buffalo, who was pretty good, pretty good pro-style quarterback, especially under Lance Leipold. Wasn't great under Mari Slingas last year, but... Uh, the wide receiver, Singleton, from Houston, I, I think he's going to help. He's speedy. He's good. Uh, is used to more of a pro style. But what about the offensive line? Like, what what are we going to do here? I you, you got several of them back. I mean, you're number 24 in returning production on offense. But if the offensive line is used to doing things a certain way and then they have to pass block, well, that's a whole different beast. That changes the whole, the whole thing. Looking at the defense... Will Harris coached uh, defensive backs at Washington and did a pretty damn good job. Look at some of the guys he's putting in the NFL. But uh, but he is going to be their new defensive coordinator. You got 12 guys coming back with 200-plus snaps. Uh, talent isn't bad down there. You you look at the, the roster strength, it's not awful. Um, the front seven was pretty good against the run last year. They were number 65. That's the one shining spot. That was the one bright spot for Georgia Southern's defense. They were number 64 in success rate, number 81 in yards per rush. Like, no, it wasn't great, but it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as some of the other stuff that they, that they did. Uh, the secondary returns the most experience, but again, number 102 success rate allowed, number 118 QBR allowed. Like, are they going to be able to improve under this new DC? That's, that's the question. Again, all these teams, I got a lot of questions about. Uh, there's nothing definitive about these teams. Um, the keys to the season here, I, I wrote down teams that have moved away from the option have not been very successful. And think about Bill Callahan and Nebraska. And then think about Georgia Tech right now and the difficulties that they've had from moving to the trip or from the triple into a more pro style or something where you throw the ball more often, for sure. And it takes a long time. But maybe, maybe bringing in those transfers can speed up that process. But how do you shift the fundamentals? for 77% of your returning production on offense? That's the question. Defense shouldn't matter that much. But on the other side, it can get real tricky. We'll see what they end up doing when you bring in a, a signal caller that really knows what he's doing, like Cal Van Trees. Uh, he's a veteran. He's been running a pro style for a long time. I would imagine that they're okay, but again, roster strength, all the turnover, et cetera, I don't think this is going to be an easy year, especially in this division. I mean, good gracious, this division. And they're non-conference. They play at Nebraska, at UAB, and they play Ball State. Why? Why do it to yourself? I mean, those are all teams that, even if you were, like, really good, even if you weren't in the middle of a transition, those would still be really difficult outs. So, why? I've got this team sitting at 3-9, and nine, Projected SP plus record from Bill Conley is five and seven. I don't see the five and seven. I, you know, I think losing the coach, uh, and I, I'm not a, I, I don't believe that much in Clay Helton. I think he can be good there long term, 
And if you're going to let him switch it over from the triple, obviously you got to give him a long time. You got to be dedicated to the process. I just, I don't see it. I like the DC hire. I don't know much about the OC. Like, I think most of what happened at Western Kentucky was Zach Kitley, but, well, and Bailey Zapp, of course. I'm just interested. I'm very interested in what they're going to do here uh, because I don't think they're going to be good this year. I think it could take a little while before they get that roster up to snuff. I'll say that. And you know what else I'm curious about? I'm curious about Georgia Southern fans. From what I have understood about them over in Statesboro for a long time is they identified with the triple option. Their their team was a blue collar, kick your ass kind of team. Like everybody everybody knows about the Gator, right? But I I'm curious what the fans think about this hire. What do they think about this team, this style? Are they going to put up with this for a long time? Do they want to? Do they care about getting more and more uh, competitive when it comes to championships in the Sun Belt, or do they want to maintain that identity? And when they moved away from uh, from Willie Fritz and then tried, you know, whatever the, the situation was, they tried to go a little pro style. Not a lot of people happy about that. They did Chad Lunsford, let him run the triple. Everything was good until it wasn't. But they were very happy with running the triple. They, they identified with that. So I'm curious. And if I'm wrong, you Georgia Southern fans, hop in here and let me know. I would like to hear from you. Jump into the comments for sure. But this is one I'm going to be keeping an eye on for yeah, quite some time. Quite some time. Another tricky one on the docket here. And this is a first-timer to Winning Cures Everything, really. The James Madison Dukes. Kurt Signetti is the head coach. Went 12-2 and in FCS last year. This will be their first year in the FBS. You look at the returning production, this was not the ideal season for them to jump into FBS. I will say that. Uh, number 97 in returning production, that's 56%. Number 76 on offense. Number 106 on defense. Roster strength? Yeah, it ain't there. It ain't there. Number 124 when it comes to recruiting, experience, etc. That's certainly not good. Number 106 on offense, number 130 on defense. That's via the guys over at CFB Winning Edge, uh, Nick and those guys. I Let's talk about the offense first. Kurt Signetti built a ton of depth, already basically had an FBS-level offense. Three returning offensive linemen, average six foot four, 318 pounds, but your quarterback, your running back, and all but one wide receiver are gone. So you've got the offensive line that could theoretically compete in the FBS. Of course, you're competing in this division, which I believe is the best division in all of the G5. I mean, this... This lineup of teams is just absurd. You got great coaches, you got great talent, you got I mean, this is this is a murderer's row for any of these teams. So this is really, really difficult. Uh the Colorado State quarterback Todd Centio transferred in along with the running back AJ Davis out of Pitt. And they brought in wide receiver uh Kobe White from Boston College. Those guys should help, right? They've been around the block, they know what they're doing, they should help, and there there's talent there. Uh, but again, it's not experience. It's not experience in this system, et cetera. I, I do trust Kurt Signetti. I, I think he's a really, really good coach. Remember, JMU was the number two in FCS for a decade. I mean, a long, long time. Uh, Mike Houston, who was the or who is the head coach at East Carolina and has done a pretty good job with the Pirates over the last three years, he was JMU's coach. Kurt Signetti kept that ball rolling. Can he keep the ball rolling as they move into FBS on the defense? There are studs on the defensive line and in the secondary. Linebacker looks weak talent-wise, I suppose. But again, we'll see. If you're well-coached, it doesn't necessarily matter which talent rating was, which your recruiting ranking was. Chris and I talk about this all the time. Uh, was This team was number five in yards per rush allowed in FCS. They were number seven in scoring defense, number two in tackles for loss, number one in turnovers forced, but how does that translate, again, to the best division in the G5? How does that translate? We understand what it's like in FCS, but they just overwhelmed everybody. Everybody in FCS, aside from North Dakota State, I suppose. Uh, I got no idea what to expect here. 
Uh, this is a strange one because you know how good this team has been, but this is a whole new level of class in this division. They have been incredibly well coached, but again, what does the what does it look like? How does it translate? They can't bowl this year, uh, but I am interested in what they look like. I'm really interested in what they look like this year. I have them going five and six. If you're going to have a losing season, this is probably the year to do it. Again, in that transition year, they only scheduled 11 games. They might look for an FCS team to play in week three or uh, or on Halloween weekend, somewhere around there, just to get up to 12. But as of right now, yeah, you know, why? You're not going bowling anyway. What does it matter? So, uh, very curious. Kurt Signetti, I think, is a, a fine, fine coach. I think he's going to do good things. It just may take a little while to get acclimated to the Sun Belt and, and playing in FBS. They, they don't have a ton of, looking at their schedule, by the way, uh, they open Middle, Middle Tennessee. They got Norfolk State. Let's see, at App State, Texas State. Uh, they do play at Louisville. That is uh, one of their non cons. Eh, we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening here. Um, moving on. Moving on. Let me write down where I am. We've only got two more to go. Uh, the Marshall Thundering Herd. Charles Huff. Last year, a decent enough first year, went 7 and 6. Post game win expectancy showed 7.32 and 4.68. So 7 and 5, somewhere around there. Uh, Marshall did lose the bowl game here. Uh, they were 6 and 7 against the spread last year, so about what you would expect. Their projected SP Plus record this year is 8 and 4. Returning production number 79 in the country, bringing about 59%. Uh, and their roster strength, surprisingly, really, really good, which could lead to them unexpectedly competing in this division. Remember, this is another one of those teams that was in Conference USA, is jumping up to the Sun Belt, and they are going to deal with uh, a little bit more difficult division than anything that they faced in the in Conference USA. Uh, how about this? Retract that little bit part. And let's just say this is a major step up in class. At, at going to play App State, Georgia State, Coastal Carolina, etc. Pretty big. Pretty big difference between that and Conference USA. Now, Marshall did have to play Western Kentucky, and they played UTSA. There are some really good teams in Conference USA. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying overall, this is a, a big step up in class. Offensive coordinator here is Clint Trickett. He takes over uh, after... Last year's OC moved over to Memphis. Um, He was the wide receivers coach and the passing game coordinator last year. Clint Trickett was. The quarterback, Grant Wells, transferred out. I don't know if that's good or bad. Their turnover margin was number 107. And while Grant Wells could fling the ball around, he did have some of those games where he was throwing three and four interceptions. And it got very frustrating very quickly. I will say that. He's got a ton of talent, but turned the ball over way too much last year. Just way too much. Um... On top of that, they weren't exactly explosive last season. Number 116 in explosive play rate on offense. What is Texas Tech transfer Henry Columbia going to look like behind an offensive line that only returns one starter? I I can't answer that right now. I, I think they brought in some dudes. I think they've got some talent. But you don't have a lot of experience here. Uh, looking at the returning production on offense, they're number 101 in the country, bringing 51% back. How many guys can you get in that will understand what Clint Trickett wants them to do? That's what we got to see. Wide receivers, Corey Gamage, Shahid Ahmed, running back Rasheen Ali. They are all super exciting. Uh, on top of that, everything here is going to depend on the offensive line and the quarterback. Like, Henry Columbia was okay for Matt Wells at Texas Tech, but obviously there's a reason why he transferred. So, what does he look like? Is, is he going to be good? I think he's the best they got on the roster right now. So we'll, I, I would imagine he he wins that job. On defense, defense coordinators Lance Gidry, former McNeese State head coach, uh, had a really good first season last year. The defense was good against the pass last year. Number 35 success rate allowed. Uh, looks to be again with pass rushers and the cornerbacks returning. Turnover at safety and defensive tackle, to me, is their biggest issue. Like, can they improve against the run? They were number 68 in success rate allowed, number 77 in yards per rush allowed. I, I'm curious. I, the defense was pretty good last year. Not not quite as good as the offense, but pretty good. But when you're only bringing back 67% on defense, only 51% on offense, 
you're going to have a lot of new pieces. Just a lot of new pieces. On top of that, um, let's jump into the keys of the season here. You got to hope that the quarterback, Columbia, and the new offensive line develop quickly. You got to stop beating yourself. They were number 116 in the country in interceptions thrown last year. Again, Grant Wells is now at Virginia Tech. Uh, they were number 105 in fumbles lost as well. So it wasn't all on Grant Wells. Uh, they were number 76 in penalties per game. That's reasonable. If you're going to be aggressive on offense and defense, you're going to have those. Uh, on, on the other side, got to find a way for the defense to develop in the middle of the line and the middle of the secondary, and you got to find a way to stop the run. That's the biggest thing. And they were okay at it, but you you got to be better, especially in this division. So I've got this team at 8-4. and four. I think that's a little higher than some people have them. Now, Projected SP Plus actually has them at 8-4. and four, But I look at the schedule, I, I see another confusing outing. Because we saw last year they lost to some teams that they probably shouldn't have lost to, and they beat some teams that, based on those other losses, they probably shouldn't have beaten. This was a very confusing team last year, and I think they'll be the same way again. I think they'll be the exact same way again, but we'll see. Uh, Manageable opening schedule, although they do have three straight road games after that opening uh, weekend game against Norfolk State. But yeah, eight and four looks reasonable here. I, I could see this team being six and six, you know, somewhere around there. I could see them being nine and three. There's enough talent here for them to be really good if everything clicks. But I, I just think eight and four sounds reasonable. Maybe seven and five, somewhere around that seven and a half game range. We'll see what the win total is when it comes out over the summer. But that would be my guess. My my guess is the win total will be seven and a half, and I'd probably take the over because I, I like the talent on this team. And I like Clint Trickett. I, I think the defensive coordinator, Gidry, is pretty good. We'll roll with that. We'll roll with that. All right, last one on the slate here. The Old Dominion Monarchs. Surprising team last year. Surprising team. Went 6-7 and seven overall. Won their last five games and made it to a bowl game. Opened up 1-6 and six last year. And... And then won their last five to get to the Myrtle Beach Bowl. Now, they got trounced by Tulsa, but regardless. Uh, their postgame win expectancy last season was 6.83 and 5.17, which reads out as about 7-5. and five. Should have been 7-5, and five, ended up 6-6. Six and six. Yeah, you get it. Ricky Ronnie has done a pretty good job recruiting and whatnot so far. It's going to take a long time to build this roster up. You're going to have to have more seasons like you had last season. I don't think this season is it. I don't think this one's it. This schedule is brutal. Their non-conference was brutal. Uh, Virginia Tech at East Carolina, at Virginia, and you got Liberty. I don't know that they can win any of them. Let me take that back. They can win. I don't know that they will. This is a tough, tough slate for the non-con. And then, of course, like I said, this division is just brutal. Uh, Looking at the offense, quarterback Hayden Wolf is back, and he's exciting, but, yeah. They got back uh, the running back Watson, three starting wide receivers led by Jennings and uh, the tight end Koontz, and, of course, four offensive line starters. They are number three in the country in offensive returning production. That is awesome. But does experience mean improvement? Remember, they were number 91 in PPA per drive on offense last year. That is not good. Now, obviously, it did get better towards the end of the season, but that was when they were playing uh, some lesser than opponents, I'll say. Lesser than roundabout. On top of that, there's no lesser thans on this schedule this year. You don't have any way to get your feet wet when you open up with Virginia Tech at East Carolina and at Virginia. I mean, this is it's brutal, just brutal. Uh, the passing success rate was number 100, and ODU's quarterbacks were number 107 in QBR last year. Again, the questions, does experience mean improvement? I can't stress enough how many times we've talked about yeah, returning production is great, but when the returning production was not good, it's not like they're all of a sudden going to get better. We'll see. We'll see what this means. Uh, the defense, by the way, number 63 in returning production, way off from the offense. Defense was good last year, but the problem is they lose some of that defense. Uh, Three-fifths of the secondary are gone, uh, along with the star linebacker, Jordan Young. I mean, they kind of led this team last year. Can the young guys maintain that number 36 PPA per drive allowed? 
I'm going to doubt it. They got experienced depth at linebacker, like plenty of defensive line. They got six guys with 330 plus snaps from last year. They got four guys with 200 plus snaps coming back at linebacker. Secondary only has three guys with 400 plus snaps. I, you know, okay, this is this is a tough tough situation. They only brought in four transfers. They lost 11, but again, they're building this through high school recruiting, and I understand why Ricky Ronnie would want to do that. So. They started, again, 1-6 and six last year, finished 5-0, and oh, then got trounced in the Myrtle Beach Bowl. Uh, the first three non-con games are pretty rough. Road slate looks impossible. The road slate, by the way, at Coastal, at Georgia State, at App State, at South Alabama. <laughs> I mean, who, who did this to them? This is just wrong. Just wrong. Uh, a bowl game this year is, is going to be difficult, even with so much experience returning from a team that made a bowl last year. Uh, there are playmakers and potential superstars, but the roster lacks talented depth. I, you know, we'll we'll see what this looks like. This is another CUSA team that's that's making the move up, and and again, this is a brutal division. This is tough. This is going to be really really difficult. So uh, I've got them three and nine. I don't like it. I hope that they do well. I like the Monarchs. I like what they're building there. I, I like the logo. I like. Uh, it, the stadium. I like all this stuff around them. But man, this step up in, in divisions is rough. I think it's going to be a really rough first year. Three and nine for Old Dominion. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com. And if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.